thanks so much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure for me to give this talk. So this is the outline of the talk. Actually, I'll, I'll briefly introduce uh, the importance of spin-orbit coupling. Uh, and then I'll focus basically on the, uh, the exotic spin texture that we recently found on two-dimensional magnet. So we are basically a density functional theory group. I, I work in Italy here on the Adriatic coast, and I lead a very small group. And here you see Danina Moroso and Paolo Barone, who are actually the main author who contributed to the work I'll, I'll show today. So I'd like to thank them also. Uh, so our, our expertise on, is on different classes of materials, uh, ranging on, from oxides to organics, from surfaces to interfaces. And recently we moved to, this, to the magnets that are a class of material, which is very exciting. Uh, as I said, I'm a density functional theorist, uh, but we benefit a lot from symmetry analysis on model Hamiltonian when we do our uh, analysis of the results. Um, so the focus being a density functional theory, of course, is on electronic structure, uh, but we uh, really focus on the microscopic mechanism underlying you know, the phenomena that we observe. Uh, because if we understand the mechanism, then we can, of course, optimize and eventually do some materials design as well. Um, so our um, field of um, expertise is on actually cross-coupling in different materials. So for a long time, we've been studying the coupling between ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism in the so-called multiferroics. And then we move to another uh, you know, co coupling uh, between ferroelectricity and spin orbit coupling. And we proposed a class of material called Rashba ferroelectrics, in which basically the polarization actually in an electric field is actually able to tune the spin texture arising from the Rashba effect. And recently we moved to the coupling between magnetism and topology by studying stirring, which is actually the topic of my talk today. Okay, spin orbit coupling, just a brief uh, you know, uh, recall of what spin orbit is. It's actually a, a, you know, the, the interaction between spin and orbital momentum. So it's actually the interaction that links spin space and, and real space in most of the materials that we actually study, apart from you know, very heavy elements, actinides and related, it's usually a small interaction. So if you compare it with you know, the energy scale of hybridization is you know, order of magnitude smaller, but it actually gives rise to many exotic phenomena. So it can be really important for, uh, for in many fields. Oops. Uh, so it is important, of course, in, uh, in both non-magnetic and magnetic solids. So all the topological physics that we've been you know, uh, interested in in the last decade or so is actually based or rooted on spin orbit coupling. And also this Rashford Dresselhaus effect and spin valley coupling is also, you know, there are also manifestations of spin orbit coupling in non-magnetic zone. But of course, it's also relevant in, in magnetism because it's primarily the source of magnetic anisotropy. And it also gives rise to more um, exotic and tiny um, phenomena, such as the moria interaction and also an isotropic exchange, which I will carefully discuss today. Um, so to the magnets, uh, just a brief recall, because I mean, it's a class of material that has boomed since uh, 2016 or 17, with the discovery actually of ferromagnetism in a single layer or few layer of prototypical chromium-3. Um, so there is, you know, a lot of uh, activity actually going on, but also there is, a, a, I feel, a need for an improved understanding. Uh, so of course, when we uh, give a talk or think about 2D magnets, the first thing that comes to our mind is the Mermin Wagner theorem and whether we can really have uh, a long range magnetic ordering in a 2D magnet, because this theorem states that actually uh, based on isotropic interaction, it is not possible to have a long range ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic ordering. So this is 
a field, actually, uh, or yeah, field, I would say, in which actually it's anisotropy and therefore spin orbit is actually needed. So I cannot have any you know, ordering if I don't have a source of anisotropy. Um, oops. Okay, so I will focus on a class of material whose structure is shown actually here. So these are nickel halide, so nickel with chlorine, bromide, or iodide. Uh, these are Van der Waals materials. So you have a layer of uh, nickel iodide too, which are uh, separated by a Van der Waals gap. Uh, the, the, the nickel is octahedrally coordinated and the different octahedra are edge shared. So the nickel actually forms a triangular lattice, which is very important for what will uh, come later. So if I now uh, look at the electron filling of nickel, nickel is the eight, so I expect a moment in an octahedral crystal field, I expect a moment of two bore magneton, and there is also a little bit of, uh, of um, um, induced moment on the halide. So if I now look at chlorine bromide iodine series, then of course I see spin orbit increases because this scale is at square of z fourth. So I expect stronger uh, spin orbit effects in iodine compared to chlorine. So the crystal of nickel iodide were, and also the bromide were actually studied in the 80s. <laughs> and already at that time, uh, some complex magnetism was detected. Um, so uh, now we basically uh, want to study uh, the magnetic, do a magnetic characterization of the of this material in a monolayer form. So as I said, if I look at the monolayer, my nickel um, my nickel atom lie in a triangular lattice. Um, so a triangular lattice is a bit peculiar uh, because of course it reminds us uh, of frustration in case of an antiferromagnet. This is a paradigmatic case. Uh, frustration means what? Frustration means that I cannot satisfy all the exchange interactions that are at play. So for example, if I have an antiferromagnetic interaction on my triangle, uh, so I place my two spin, one with spin up and the other one with spin down, and then the third spin doesn't actually know what to do because if it lies parallel to the first one, this interaction is happy, but this one is not. And if I place it the opposite way, this interaction is happy, but this one is not. So it actually ends up in, you know, compromising the interaction at play by having this 120 degree uh, spin structure. Um, so the frustration is actually strongly linked to the geometry of the lattice. So there are certain lattices that are particularly prone to frustrated effect, frustration effects. So there is a triangular lattice, the Kagome lattice, and also in 3D, the biotinors. Um, I can also have frustration in a single chain, very also another, another paradigmatic case. Uh, so if, for example, I have a first nearest neighbor interaction, which is ferromagnetic, and then a strong second nearest neighbor interaction, which is anti-ferromagnetic, this is also frustrated material, uh, frustrated chain, let's say. Huh? So what is the ground state of, of this chain? So if I have strong anisotropy, which means that I can treat my spin as easing spin, so there is a you know, very much preferred direction, then the ground state would be up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, because then at least the second nearest neighbor interaction is always satisfied, they're always lying anti-parallel. This is, you know, once frustrated and once not, but if it's small, then this is the, really the ground state. In case the strong anisotropy is not there, so I have more like Heisenberg spin, then the, the ground state would be more like a cyclic like spiral. Okay, um, so uh, we can do uh, first principle calculation and we can actually extract from our uh, data the Heisenberg exchange, the exchange coupling constant. So the easiest Hamiltonian that we can think of is Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So if I do that for, for our system, then I can extract the first nearest neighbor coupling, which is strong and ferromagnetic. The second one is really negligible. So 
really, I mean, not, not zero, but very close to being zero. But then the third nearest neighbor interaction is actually strong, strongly anti-ferromagnetic. Mm -hmm. So now if I try to place my spins on the lattice according to this, you know, J1, J2, and J3, then what happens? Uh, J1 is strongly ferromagnetic, so my first shell would be this, but then the third J3 is actually anti-ferromagnetic. So I place my three spin in an anti-ferromagnetic way, but then you see already there is a frustration, right? Because then this interaction cannot be ferromagnetic, right? So there is a frustration. So I expect from this frustration some, you know, complex, exotic, uh, uh, non-collinear uh, spin structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, a little step further. Mm -hmm. So we learned in you know magnetism course that the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is you know basic Hamiltonian that we should learn. Uh, ha actually, uh, it is not fully correct. Because the interaction between two spins, Si and Sj, can actually be described by a matrix. Um, so even, even if I take my matrix and I decompose it from the mathematical point of view, let's say, I can always decompose my matrix in a, in a, a sort of diagonal form with a trace. And then I decompose the rest in an anti-symmetric and a traceless symmetric part. This I can do for every matrix, right? But in, of course, when we move to physics, this decomposition actually has a meaning in, in the microscopic terms. So this is actually the first term is the conventional Heisenberg term, fully isotropic. This anti-symmetric is generally what people call Zeloschitzkin or the interaction. And then there is these other parts, which is called anisotropic exchange. So it's a symmetric term. So what, what do they do? So the first one, Heisenberg, of course, we know that. I mean, it, it favors, for example, parallel spin compared to anti-parallel, but it's fully isotropic. It means that if I consider this one or this one, it's the same. Heisenberg doesn't care you know, about you know, how the spin are aligned in, in, in real space. Seleuchiske Moria does what? I mean, it's a cross product, so it tends to count spin, right? Zero for, for parallel spin. And it, 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 it tends to count the spin in a preferred direction because there is the Seleuchiske Moria vector in front of the cross product, which actually favors, for example, this counting compared to this other counting. Hmm? And then there is this anisotropic exchange. What does it do? This also tries to favor uh, spin to lie in a, in a direction in space. And so it's similar actually to, uh, to single ion anisotropy, but it's actually a two-side term. Uh, actually, people also call it two-side anisotropy. Uh, and it's also already in the paper by Moria, it was clear, clearly discussed, and it actually is also rooted in, in spin orbit coupling, so it's actually scaled with z squared, so it, we expect it to be important in heavy elements. So in, in our system, in nickel I and I or nickel halide monolayer, uh, there is an inversion symmetry. Uh, so Celsius Moria is, is forbidden. Celsius Moria is only active when we break inversion symmetry. And because of the symmetry properties that we have, actually the matrix is has this form. So you have a diagonal term, which are all different, and then there is one off diagonal term. It is symmetric, so it is the same to element two, three is equal to element three, two. Okay, so now we can extract actually the matrix from our density functional theory calculation. And what do we see? Um, if we do this characterization in nickel chloride, basically this matrix will actually be very close to what you expect from Heisenberg term. So basically, no anisotropy Jxx being equal to Jyy being equal to Jzz, and then no of diagonal term, pure Heisenberg system. In nickel bromide, a little bit heavier. 
So we start seeing some anisotropy along the diagonal and also some off diagonal turn, small but present. And if we look at nickel iodide, then there is a big difference in the diagonal turn and also a large off diagonal element. So we see clearly the effect of spin orbit coupling, not by the transition metal atom, because it's the same here, here, and here, but given by the halide atom. So iodine has 5p orbital, they show strong spin orbit uh, effect, and as such, it also affects the super exchange that actually is at the basis of the magnetic interaction between nickel and nickel. Okay, um, so if we, um, the density functional theory is a theory that we can use at zero temperature, so we can only do a characterization at zero temperature. So what, what if we want to, you know, go towards finite temperature and extra, for example, the Curie temperature and also the ground state spin configuration. We typically resort to Monte Carlo simulation. So we basically have our Hamiltonian with the parameter estimated from from this principle, and then we, we do Monte Carlo and get the main properties. So just uh, one um, uh, just one uh, word about the notation notation or way of showing the spin texture that I will use. So I can show a three dimensional picture like this, but I will use this notation. So I will show in the plane the arrows actually show the in-plane spin component so by arrow i will plot the spin i will project the spin on the plane and then by color i plot the out of plane spin component so for example here i have my spin pointing uh, up and this will be uh, red and then this other part which is lying in the plane will be basically close to zero something like this Okay, so um, now let's look at Monte Carlo simulation results in nickel bromide. I said that we have some strong frustration because of J3 is strongly antiferromagnetic and J1 is ferromagnetic. And I said in the beginning that if I have a, a second nearest neighbor, also third nearest neighbor in the triangular lattice, the ground state is a spiral. And this is what I see. So we basically, it's a complex uh, helix actually, uh, but we basically get what we expect. Uh, we sort of expect to have not some non-collinearity, it's exotic, but we sort of expect it. The, here I also show the specific heat, which says, which tells us what is the Curie temperature or the OML temperature. It's pretty low as you expect for, from a frustrated system. So not so much novelty. I mean, it's interesting, but not unexpected. Uh, what we didn't expect was actually what we found for nickel iodide. So for nickel iodide, we got this ground state. Um, okay. Uh, so you basically recognize an order pattern, pattern. So it's a lattice for sure. Um, however, we wanted to characterize it more. And so we started, when we saw it, we started to think that it could be a sort of schizmionic like lattice. So we went back, um, studied the physics of schizmion, which was not actually our field. So we really started by the basic, you know, theory of or finding by Bogdano et al. So it's, it's actually topological. Uh, spin configuration. Uh, and also, uh, typically, you get a skirmion phase, um, like a phase diagram which is common, let's say, to, to many of the systems that show skirmion. So you typically start from a helix, non collinear spin pattern. And then, as you apply a field, magnetic field, then you evolve towards conical and eventually ferromagnetic system. And here, hmm, the skirmion phase developed. So this is this kind of phase diagram is quite common to many of the systems that are going to, to show skirmion. So you typically get a skirmion phase upon application of magnetic field, not as a ground state. Also, there are many kinds of skirmion 
uh, also there are antiskermian where the direction of yeah, the rotational sense of the of the spins going from the peripheral area to the center actually changes if I change the symmetry axis. So for example, if I move from this direction, it would uh, be counterclockwise. If I change, if I go along this other direction, it will be clockwise. So these are called anti um, So how do I characterize? I said, you know, these are topological objects. Then how to characterize the topological behavior. And there is this topological, so-called topological charge, which is actually originally formulated in a continuum model. We don't have you know, a continuum approach in our, uh, in our Monte Carlo, we have atomistic uh, spins, uh, spins basically localized on atoms. And so the, the topological charge can actually be estimated through the basically triple product of scalar spin chirality in this way. So we have in our triangle, uh, triangular lattice, we can identify three spins and then we can make a scalar product with the vector product of two other. So already from here, you see that you can only have a, a non-trivial topological charge only if you have non-coplanarity. And so it's not enough to have non-collinearity but it's needed to have non-coplanar non spin. That is uh, quite common. And also this topological charge, uh, basically you, one, you know that one can map actually the skirmionic uh, pattern, which is, is actually a two-dimensional pattern. You can wrap it up around the sphere and this Q here actually, the, oops, actually uh, tells you how many times the sphere wraps around, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the spin texture wraps around the sphere. So Q equal one is actually this pattern. Q equal two means that there are twice, the, the, the wrapping happens twice. Okay, so uh, what if we do this, calculate this topological charge in our lattice? This is what is shown here, actually. And we see that basically in the unit cell, which looks like, this one, there are actually three topological objects, each of them has a Q of two. Eh? So we get six here in total. And we can also get the Curie temperature or male temperature here. It's also again small, which is also what we expect because it's a really frustrated system. Eh? And also one can calculate the spin structure function. So we see six parts. So this, this is a kind of triple Q uh, state. Okay, so um, here we get this topological charge as ground state. Um, I should also say that actually the, the, there is a very um, competing energy state, which is the spiral. So they are actually very, very close in energy. So I, I actually cannot you know, foresee whether you know, in nickel I2, one would always see this topological um, spin pattern. But as I said, we are pretty much interested in, you know, the microscopic mechanism. Um, so what we see here is actually uh, an arising of a potentially anti skirmionic lattice in a two-dimensional magnet. Mm -hmm. It's not driven by Tsiluchisky Moria, and it's a lattice. So you clearly recognize the periodicity um, even here, a word of caution, uh, we cannot really, see, so we see the periodicity in our Monte Carlo simulation looks A times A. I cannot say whether it's you know, commensurate or incommensurate, for example, because we forced it to be commensurate, but I think the scale of the periodicity should be you know, similar to, to what we see, so of the order of eight or so. Mm -hmm. It's so, okay, it's a lattice. So to construct the lattice, actually, I can start from an antiskermion, an isolated antiskermion with Q equal to, and then I can place my antiskermion in a triangular lattice, and I can bring my you know, triangle close so as to form a lattice. And this is actually what we see here. In our case, the antiskermion are really small. So it's really few, few spins that form the, this winding patterns. Uh, what happens if I apply a magnetic field? Hmm? Then if I do that in, in the Carlo simulation, then we uh, go, go back to a more conventional skirmion pattern. So we 
you know, things that are winding without changing direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I now plot my phase diagram, then I go as a function of magnetic field, then I go from a Q equal to, say, the, the undiscriminate, then I drop sharply in a topological fashion to a Q equal one, more conventional case, and then if I really apply a very strong field, then it goes ferromagnetic. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the phase diagram. Okay, um, so it, we, we think uh, that it is very important to have both the ingredient. One is the JYZ, so some strong anisotropic exchange, but it is also um, pretty much important to have a frustrated system. So the J3 over J1 exchange coupling frustration is also important because we cannot stabilize an antispermian phase or if we know we're not able to do that if we don't have any frustration in the Heisenberg exchange coupling. And also, um, it is very important to have a strong JYZ. So for example, in Monte Carlo, we artificially change the magnitude of this JYZ, not calculating from first principle by tuning it by hand. And actually, you see that just changing this JYZ compared to the first nearest neighbor and interaction actually can give rise to an anti with Q equal to or to a helix, which is the, the spiral with Q equal zero. So the spiral links and actually it's a spin helix. The spin helix is, is a non topological uh, spin pattern. Okay, so uh, a little bit more on the, on the interpretation. So I said we have this, from the symmetry uh, point of view, we have this kind of matrix. It's a symmetric matrix. I can always diagonalize it. And if I do that, I can calculate my eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Hmm? So how do these eigenvectors are actually placed on the lattice? Huh? So uh, to do this, I need to basically describe my lattice with so-called plaquette. So a plaquette is actually a, a rhombus, a default square uh, built from nickel, iodine, nickel, iodine um, atoms. So if I look at my lattice, actually this plaquette are actually placed in a complex pattern, in a non-coplanar non way, something like this. So if I place my eigen vectors on with respect to the plaquette, huh? I will see that basically there is one eigenvector pointing along the iodine iodine ligand, another one pointing from nickel to nickel, and then the third one, of course, perpendicular. Hmm? So actually, the, this, the direction of the eigenvector with larger negative eigenvalues is the one that drives you know, the spin to to lie along that direction. So finding this description is actually very important to understand then what this anisotropic exchange will tend to do. So it will actually tend to align in the perpendicular direction with respect to the plaquette, but the fact that the plaquettes are actually non-coplanar, it also a source for additional frustration. And so in the end, basically the frustration in the exchange coupling constant J3 over J1, but also this kind of frustration is actually what gives rise to the non-coplanarity and also spin chirality that we actually see in, in the, in the, from the Monte Carlo uh, characterization. Last slide, uh, can this happen in chromium I3? Chromium I3 is the paradigmatic example. Uh, so people have actually, have actually calculated the exchange matrix. And also there, they could show that there is some anisotropic exchange. However, the J3 over J1 frustration is not there. And we believe it's not there because the lattice is different. So chromium I3 is a honeycomb lattice. So there is a hole here. So the J3 actually lacks something to mediate the interaction. So it's actually very, very small. And as I said, if I don't have this J3 over J1, I am never able to stabilize an anti pattern. I mean, actually, chromium 3 is well known to be ferromagnetic. Okay, 
uh, let me wrap up. So we have a Q equal to anti-scarian lattice in nickel I2. It's the first example when we discover it in two-dimensional magnet. It's a lattice and there is a topological transition under field. Okay, questions, uh, many, many questions. Uh, we lack, you know, an understanding of why nickel I2 as such a big and isotropic exchange, maybe some other material also have it. We don't have, you know, rules of thumb to say when the anisotropic exchange is large or small. Uh, does it happen also in bilayer? We only did in a monolayer. We never did bilayer, trilayer, and also the bulk. Some potential, you know, for, for the coupling between ferroelectricity and magnetism is also there. And of course, it would be great if experimentalists could actually study this system. Okay, so with this I would like to conclude and receive questions. <laughs>